So David Meeker, I'm CEO of Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, physician by training. And Rhythm is working on a, a specific pathway in the brain, melanocortin-4 pathway, which is involved in uh, how we interpret our hunger signals and how much energy we burn. But before I go into a little more detail there, I just wanted to frame where I think the world is around obesity in general. And as we know, um, historically, uh, society, physicians particularly, have often viewed obesity as a lifestyle choice. And then with the advent of uh, the new medications, which it's hard to escape from, um, we're bombarded by uh, many rem <clears throat> reminders of their availability, Wagovi or um, Zepbound, Monjero. Um, those medicines have really transformed obesity, and they've, they've allowed the world to start looking at it differently and realize that obesity is a disease. And the part that rhythm plays is absolutely, we think obesity is a disease, but it's not one disease, it's many diseases. And as with new areas that open up, they start with sort of a general understanding. And then as you look more closely, particularly as you begin to understand the genetics or the underlying biology, you realize you can start to segment those that bigger disease, if you will, now into many smaller diseases, each of which may require their own treatment. So the pathway we work on, the melanocortin-4 pathway, um, this is the pathway, we eat a meal, we get food in our stomach, gut signals, gut hormones signal to the pancreas and the fat cell, leptin is released from the adipocytes, circulates to the brain, and in the hypothalamus of the brain, one of the, the uh, areas in the brain is the arcuate nucleus, in the hypothalamus is the arcuate nucleus. And that's really the area of the brain that controls our hunger, drive, and our satiety signaling. So when leptin gets there, it inhibits the appetite stimulating side of that equation, which is a set of neurons, agouti-related peptide neurons, and it activates the POMC neuron side of the equation, which tells us we're full. And not only does it tell us we're full, signaling through that pathway, but the body now knows you got food on board so you can activate your metabolic rate and you know burn more quickly. So the patients we're trying to help who have a defect in signaling through that, it can be genetic or it can be just be through injury, they have a defect in signaling through that pathway. They're not making as much or any of the hormone, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is the signal to say you're full, you can increase your energy expenditure. And as a result, they're hungry all the time. So they eat a meal and they just keep eating. And perversely is not only do they keep eating, but the body thinks there's no food on board. So it keeps the metabolic rate low. So energy expenditure is low, which is why the obesity can be severe or, you know, come on more rapidly. So prader willi is also a genetic condition. We think there are links that this pathway plays a role in prader willi prader willi is a more complicated disease in the sense that there are other abnormalities. It's a more complex genetic disease. And what is known for, and it, there are elements that are shared across these, is that the prader willi patient suffers from severe hunger, hyperphagia, which is often associated with abnormal behaviors. I mean, obviously, if you're hungry all the time, you're irritable, you're, you know, and you can, and that with some behavioral challenges, abnormalities makes it a very visible, and it's it's also a more common disease. So many people will know Prader Willi. Not so many people, physicians particularly, know about other diseases impacting this pathway. There's, there's different causes, um, different genetic causes specifically we're talking about now of impaired signaling through this pathway. The biggest number one clue is early onset obesity. So if you are a parent with a child, the child whose obesity comes on under the age of five, you should be thinking about getting your genetics tested, number one. And then number two, if you have this severe hunger. Now, the, the challenge with what I'm describing in hunger is we all experience hunger. I know what hunger is. If I miss lunch, I'm hungry. And I think as a medical community, we tend to dismiss the history around hunger as not being so important. Um, many parents have said, you know, doctors tell them, oh, you just have a hungry child. Oh, good news. You've got a healthy child, you know, baby, and you know, good for you. Um, that goes to a more extreme setting where as a child becomes more and more overweight or obese and the physician starts saying, you've got to start restricting how much food you're feeding your child too much. And the parent in that setting is I'm not feeding my, I'm doing everything I can 
and the child may be sneaking food, there may be other reasons why they're still taking it. A child who is incessantly crying because they're hungry, what do parents do? They give them what they can, they give them more food and attempt to quiet them down. And so not recognizing an abnormal drive, this and, and why do these kids have that severe hunger? It's because whatever you give them does not satiate them. They're missing the signal that tells them they're full. So you feed them, the stomach's full, they're not getting the signal. And so they keep crying, they keep wanting food, they keep, you know, stealing. And there's, a, you know, a lot of behaviors that go along with that, particularly in kids who don't have the adult maturity to try to, to modulate some of that. So your question was, what should pediatricians be doing? Early onset obesity, particularly if it's associated with abnormal drive to eat. This is a challenge with rare diseases, and I've worked in rare diseases most of my industry career. They are characterized by, by definition. They're rare, relatively little knowledge, very few experts, and often no testing. Because it's a rare disease, you know, commercial laboratories don't tend to develop tests because it's not viable as a business model. So there's no testing. And we know in the United States, unlike outside the U.S., Europe, for example, does much better in general about, you know, having genetic testing available. It's really difficult to get genetic testing here in the U.S., often not covered, not available. So... So Rhythm, um, as a company working in rare diseases, you do what you can, which is you have to make that test available. So we've developed a panel. It's it's available. It's, you know, there's a website you can go to, Uncovering Rare Obesity, and um, order the test. So it, and Rhythm pays for it. Um, now, that's not a sustainable model for a relatively small company, but it is the only way that you can begin to get the system to change its behavior. Eventually... We think there's about, I mean, the, the CDC actually thinks there's about 5 million people in the United States who have a history of early onset obesity. Arguably, all of those patients should have their genetics tested because their challenge with their weight and maybe some of the hunger symptoms I'm describing may be linked to one of these genes. And now companies like Rhythm and Rhythm in this case for some of those genetic abnormalities, not all of them, some of them, our drug and Sivri, which is a, a, now an approved drug for three of the genetic abnormalities, it basically replaces the hormone that's missing. It's an analog of that hormone. So if you have low levels, this drug replaces it. And just like, you know, many hormonal deficiencies, right? Thyroid, you have a low thyroid, you replace it with thyroid hormone. This is not different. It's just unrecognized. So let's take the Ozempic example, These, the class of GLP-1s, which are amazing medicines. I mean, they, they're going to transform not just healthcare, but society, I think, at the end of the day. Those drugs work, in theory, in a patient with general obesity. Their biology, their circuits are otherwise relatively normal. Now, there'll be variations on that, but relatively normal. They're giving excessive amounts of this hormone, this GLP-1 Ozempic, which causes you to have a decreased appetite. And in some cases, almost an aversion to food, right? You read these articles, people say, I lose my interest in food. I just, I used to love X, I don't love it anymore. And as a consequence, you lose weight. Our drug, if you gave our drug to a person with that form of obesity, they may lose a few percentage points of their weight, but that's it. So it doesn't, if you don't have a deficiency in the hormone, giving more of this, doesn't cause you to lose more weight. If you have normal signaling, you eat a meal, and that signaling goes through, you're full, giving more of this drug doesn't get you, you know, more weight loss in a sense. So where it is working and where the effects can be quite, you know, interesting and significant is if you have a deficiency state. And that's where this drug works. So your question is, is this drug likely to be abused in that sense? No. And the key to the world we live in is, first, you've got to get to a diagnosis which would suggest that you have a deficiency in that hormone, uh, that signaling state. And then there's a therapy. Yes, take the therapy. And, you know, for those areas so far, the genetic diseases for which it's been approved, it's been effective. Working in rare diseases, um, they're often genetically based. Our initial approvals are for these genetically um, based diseases. By definition, they start at birth. And so you want to treat people as early 
as you can, which means you got to make the diagnosis as early as you can. Now, starting when you run clinical trials, the way you traditionally develop a medicine is you start in adults, and then if they work, it's okay in adults. You you know work your way down and treat younger and younger people. In a rare disease, you often end up starting in kids. And so from the beginning, we've been treating kids in our trials. Now we went down to the age of six. So our initial approvals were for six and above, but we know, and many, many painful stories, A, it starts at birth and kids, parents, families are suffering under the age of six. And the accumulated morbidities from obesity, all the cardiovascular risks, you know, diabetes, the you know, mash, the metabolic abnormalities, the liver, you know, complications and the like, all of that starts with your obese, I mean, your risk accumulates over time. So the earlier you can intervene, in theory, hard to prove in a rare disease, but in theory, we should be able to decrease your future risks by intervening earlier and help you, you avoid the development of a lot of those complications, which are the cause of the significant morbidity and mortality. So what did we do? Um, once we got approved for six and above, we ran a trial in ages two to six, under six. We had 11 patients, again, super rare, um, meaning hard to find young kids. They have to be diagnosed, able and willing to participate in the trial. So we got 11 patients, including a couple patients in Australia, some in Europe and you know, patients in the US. And uh, the 11 total followed for a year and proved that and in unblinded, you don't need controlled trials here. They have a severe disease that doesn't spontaneously get better. They had very good results, meaning pretty dramatic, you know, decreases in their weight. Most importantly, they lost weight, but also now they weren't gaining more as they went through. Um, and it's not the kids. So when I say weight, that's incorrect. Kids will grow. They should gain weight over time, but they're gaining proportional to their height. So we, we've talked about where we're approved um, in these genetic diseases and um, what's become really interesting, and we have ongoing trials um, now for patients who are suffering with, classically, these are young kids who have a, a benign tumor, and the tumor grows in that part of the brain between the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And when they go to surgery um, to get the tumor resected, uh, and they can live you know, a normal lifespan often um, with that, um, in about half the cases, they injure the hypothalamus. And in injuring the hypothalamus, they they'll very rapid weight gain. And our very preliminary results suggest that this hormonal replacement, this melanocortin-4 pathway, is part responsible for that very rapid weight gain. And, you know, they, in our phase two study, they had, had a good response to this drug, and we're testing that now in a phase three. But my point in bringing that up now is that for the medical system and healthcare professionals who are out there, there's the classic, you know, genetic, rare kind of diseases, which may cause you to end up in this grouping. But there are these other areas where injury to that kind of brain produces the same physiology, meaning the severe obesity, the hyperphagia, associated comorbidities and the like. So so it's become, you know, like many diseases, you start out, you know, observing and, you know, calories in, calories out, and then it's increasingly now down to the underlying genetics, the biology, the different, you know, neuronal circuits in the brain and different therapies that can try to address those in a way that's, you know, more specific. <laughs>